All right, we're going to move into chapter 12, um, which is electrical currents for muscle contraction. So all of the things that we've um, talked about in chapter 11, of course, apply to this chapter as well. So um, that what we're going to talk about is muscle contractions in innervated muscle, um, clinical applications of electrically stimulated muscle contractions, muscle contractions in denervated muscle, so there's no more connection between the nerve and the muscle because of injury or disease, and um, parameters for electrical stimulation of contractions of innervated muscles. So we will practice all of these in the lab and um, sort of ho hopefully get an idea of how it's going to work and also how it feels. So the learning objectives for this section, I want you to be able to describe the effects of electrical currents on both innervated and denervated muscle. I want you to be able to state six clinical applications of electrical stim for strengthening. And um, ask yourself, probably not right now, but later on, which parameter would you change if the stimulated muscle were twitching um, and you wanted to elicit tetany, which is that firm muscle contraction? which parameter is the one you want to change. Um, I want you to be able to describe how frequency, duration, on-off time, and ramp time affect overall motor response with ESTEM. So back to the strength duration curve, um, the stimulation of action potentials in nerves, the neuromuscular electrical stim, um, the amount of electricity required to produce an action potential depends on the type of nerve. So short pulses for sensory, longer for motor. Um, if we're doing electrical stim for um, motor training, we are going to need something when we look at this graph in the 150 to 300 millisecond range of duration. So longer pulse durations to stimulate those motor nerves. Um, are we also going to be stimulating sensory nerves at those uh, longer pulse durations? Yes, we are. So <laughs> you have the sensation, but we also then have the motor effect. When we're in the lower um, pulse duration ranges, we can be stimulating sensory nerves, but not be getting a motor effect. So with innervated muscle, um, when action potentials are propagated along motor nerves, the muscle fibers, fibers innervated um, by those nerves become depolarized and contract. So um, muscle contractions produced by electrically stimulated action potentials are similar to physiological um, action potentials. So you can use them for a similar effect in other words, muscle strengthening, muscle re-education, um, potentially edema control, because we know how that muscle pump um, functions in edema. Um, there are some differences, however, between electrically stimulated muscle contractions and voluntary physiologically initiated muscle contractions. And um, those differences have um, an impact on the therapeutic application. Um, the main difference between physiological muscle contractions and electrically stimulated muscle contractions is the order, the order of motor unit recruitment. So normally with a physiological um, initiated contraction, the smaller nerve, fi uh, nerve fibers, the, the slow twitch type 1 muscle fibers, are activated before the larger nerve and muscle fibers. But during um, electrically stimulated muscle contractions, the larger diameter nerve fi fibers, the fast twitch type 2 muscle fibers, are activated first, and then the smaller um, diameter nerve fibers are recruited later. So um, the smaller slow twitch muscle fibers produce the lower force contractions, but they're more resistant to fatigue and atrophy. So those are like your postural muscles, um, your uh, marathon runners versus your sprinters. Um, the larger fast twitch muscles produce stronger and quicker contractions, but they fatigue rapidly and they're more um, prone to weakening and atrophy with disuse. So um, the important clinical implication of that is that um, electrically stimulated contractions can very effectively strengthen the muscle fibers that are atrophied and weakened by injury or disease. So um, 
On the other side of the coin, though, those um, stimulated contractions are more fatiguing than physiological contractions, and so you need longer rest times in between them. So if you're um, doing a voluntary muscle contraction, say you're lifting weights in the gym, you don't need as long a recovery time. With electrical stim, um, it produces more fatigue, so you need longer recovery times. So um, with denervated muscle, the electrical stim can produce contractions, but since we're not stimulating the nerve to stimulate the muscle, we need really, really long pulse durations. And you're stimulating the muscle cells directly rather than stimulating the nerve. And so the, the reason for um, stimulating a denervated muscle is to keep the muscle working um, until the nerve connection can be restored, hopefully, um, or just to prevent atrophy. So um, a lot of times, um, maybe someone's had a spinal cord injury and we might use a functional electrical stim bike or something like that with them. It's not going to make them be able to walk again, but it will keep their muscles from deteriorating too much. So different um, reasons for using them. So the denervated muscle is not going to contract with the usual electrical stimulus used for innervated muscle, um, but in, with a pulsed current, a pulse duration of longer, um, 10 milliseconds or longer, um, you can stimulate the muscle cells directly. So um, just a review of the physiology, the action potential is propagated along motor nerves. It crosses the neuromuscular junction and the muscle contracts. So um, that is the, you know, what normally happens. And so when we use the electrically stimulated contraction, um, we are stimulating the motor nerves and getting the muscle to contract. And this is an innervated muscle. So um, physiologically, the slow twitch type 1s um, are initiated first. It's a low contraction force, a slow speed of contraction. They're fatigue resistant and atrophy resistant. And the muscle recruitment is asynchronous depending on the needs of the motion. Um, with the electrical, uh, electrically stimulated contraction, um, we're stimulating the fast twitch type 2s first. High contraction force, fast speed of contraction, quick fatigue, um, quick atrophy, um, when it's not stimulated, and the recruitment is synchronous, so all the muscles contract at once. So electrical stim strengthens muscle, muscles by the overload principle um, and by muscle specificity. So um, the overload principle is that the greater the load placed on the muscle, the higher force contraction it produces and the more strength the muscle will gain. So this applies to um, contractions produced by electrical stim and to regular physiological exercise. So um, with your regular physiological exercise, the load is, can be progressively increased by increasing the resistance as you get stronger. Um, with electrically stimulated contractions, the contraction forces increase uh, mostly by increasing the total amount of current um, so this can be achieved either by increasing the pulse duration, the current amplitude, or the electrode size, all of which will recruit more muscle fibers. So sometimes, um, I have found this particularly to be true with um, the functional electrical stim. Um, like we have a functional electrical stim bike in our clinic. Sometimes you can't turn up the amplitude anymore, it's too uncomfortable but you're not getting the muscle contraction that you want, so you will increase the pulse duration instead to try to get more uh, muscle contraction, um, which actually works pretty well. So it has to be a balance between the parameters so the patient can tolerate it. Um, the externally applied resistance also increases the force of electrically stimulated muscle contraction. So often, um, if you're trying to um, do neuromuscular re-ed, with someone who has voluntary muscle contraction, has innervated muscles, you will also be having them perform a voluntary movement at the same time as you're doing the um, muscle contraction. So um, with regard to specificity, 
that muscle contractions specifically strengthen the muscle fibers that are contracting. So um, since electrical stim has more effect on the type 2 muscle fibers than the, um, than the type 1, the, um, the disuse atrophy what, that you get when, a, um, when you have an injury or an illness is primarily of the type 2 fibers. So electrical stim is good for re-education of those atrophied muscles. So um, in patients with reduced muscle strength from surgery, from immobilization, like maybe they're casted, or any other kind of muscle weakening pathology, early use of electrical stimulation and adding electrical stimulation to physiological exercise can amplify and accelerate strength gains. However, it does not um, make anybody more coordinated or um, it, it's, it's not sports specific or anything like that. So you're going to increase strength, but it's not necessarily going to increase um, sports performance. So the clinical applications of um, electrically stimulated muscle contractions include um, muscle strengthening for orthopedic conditions. Um, cardiorespiratory and functional training in, in certain patient populations, and we'll talk about that. Muscle strengthening for healthy adults and athletes. Um, you don't see that too much in a physical therapy setting, more in a training type setting. Um, improved muscle coordination and motor control for neurological conditions. Um, edema control and improved circulation and um, for retardation of atrophy and return of function in denervated muscle. So we'll talk about each one of those. So after surgery, after say an ACL construction or a total knee arthroplasty, um, we are using electrical stem to try to increase strength. Usually for knee surgeries, it's the strength of the quadriceps. Um, it can also be used in non-surgical management of other knee conditions such as osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and patellofemoral syndrome. So. Um, Frequently, we are using, um, well, we're using, you know, neuromuscular electrical stim. Um, there are lots of different um, applications that we could use for the strengthening, and we will um, go through those in lab, and we'll learn them. So for cardiorespiratory uh, and functional training in uh, patient populations, um, muscle training with electrical stim has the potential to increase peak op oxygen intake. Um, the six minute walk test distance, so you time someone for six minutes and see how far they can walk. Um, increasing muscle strength, um, increasing flow mediated dilation of blood vessels. Um, it has, um, it can affect depressive symptoms and improve overall quality of life. So. Um, this is based on um, different studies that were done in um, 2016 with um, NMAS and critically ill patients. So um, that's pretty cool that uh, you can improve someone's um, quality of life by something simple like electrical stim. So there was a completely unrelated to electrical stim, but related to improving strength to increase quality of life. There was a study that was published in the, um, Amer the Journal of the American Medical Association several years ago now um, about building strength in people um, over the age of 80. And they took a group of people, all of them were um, living in skilled nursing facilities. Um, many of them were using wheelchairs for mobility and they used just progressive resistance training on their quadriceps. They only strengthened that one muscle group and um, by the end of the study, all of the people in the study who were all over 80 had improved their strength. And many of them were not using the wheelchair anymore. They were actually walking and it improved their mobility. So obviously that improved their quality of life. So whether you're using electrical stim for strengthening or you're, or you're doing any other strengthening thing, you have the potential to improve somebody's quality of life, which is fantastic. So... Muscle strengthening for healthy adults and athletes is usually done in more of a sports medicine or performance setting rather than in a rehabilitation setting. Um, the um, NMES added to strength training, so you're doing the traditional strength training, but you're adding 
the electrical stim. You can enhance strength gains. It may or may not enhance functional performance, and it's not a substitute for sports-specific training. So just because your muscle is, is stronger doesn't mean it's going to function better in your sport. So um, contractions greater than 50% of the maximum voluntary isometric contraction um, are required in order to um, increase muscle strength in healthy adults and athletes. So other conditions that can be treated um, with neuromuscular electrical stim are dysphagia, which is a swallowing, difficulty swallowing, urinary incontinence and pelvic floor dysfunction, because that's a muscular thing. Um, you can promote circulation and reduce risk of DVT formation with um, neuromuscular electrical stim added to strength training. And this is all based on studies that were done with that. And they're, most of the studies are quoted in the book. So um, improved muscular coordination and motor control for neurological conditions. Um, this is really, this is always, I, I will have to say, integrated with performance of functional activities. So um, functional electrical stimulation often is a specific device that is assisting you in a particular way. There's, for example, there is a functional electrical stim device that goes on your tibialis anterior to help combat foot drop after a stroke or a similar um, neurological um, incident that um, keeps your tibialis anterior from giving you enough dorsiflexion to clear your toe when you're walking. So um, basically that functional electrical stim device you step on it and it stims you and um, makes you go into dorsiflexion. So the good part about it is it stimulates intact peripheral nerves in patients with central nervous system damage. So um, spinal cord injury, stroke, MS, TBI, um, CP, cerebral palsy. Um, so it can help improve coordination and motor control. Um, not necessarily going to um, cause return of function, except as it might play into um, functional reorganization of the cerebral cortex. So it depends on the injury. So this is um, the uh, device that I was talking about with the uh, that helps with dorsiflexion. It goes um, below your knee and um, it's stimulated by weight bearing and causes that uh, tibialis anterior to contract. So um, electrical stim for stroke, a lot of times um, we're using it for lower extremity stimulation to improve gait, increase ankle dorsiflexion torque, um, reduce the agonist antagonist co-contraction that you'll get with muscle synergies. And we'll talk about that more in um, neuro rehab in the spring. Um, there is, if people can improve their lower extremity um, function, there is an increased probability of them being able to return home, um, which is great, and not have to live in a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living facility. Um, so there, there, is, there are um, neuromuscular e-stim applications that are triggered by um, electromyelograms. Um, that is more done in a neurology setting rather than in a PT setting, but um, you can also use electrical stim to um, contract the antagonist muscle to an agonist muscle that has spasticity. Um, and you can use agonist contraction to increase agonist strength and control. So lots of um, effects, good effects for stroke. For um, spinal cord injury, a lot of times you're just, you're trying to counteract the um, muscle atrophy that results from disuse. So you want to improve circulation, you want to contract muscle to assist with locomotion, contract muscles to assist with things like hand grasp, respiration, conditioning, and bowel and bladder voiding. So um, you have to um, stim for sufficient force in order to carry out the activity, but have it not be painful. And it has to be controlled and repeated, and the sensation has to be acceptable to the user. So a lot of times um, when you're working with someone with functional electrical stim, um, it's too intense and they can't handle it. So you, you really have to work with the individual person and come up with settings that work for them. So if you can't 
um, generate sufficient force to carry out an activity without it being too painful, well then it might not be the um, intervention that you want to use with that person. So for edema control and improved circulation, um, contraction of the limb muscles compresses the veins and lymphatic vessels and promotes um, flow of fluid from the periphery um, to take it back into the venous system. And we talked about this in um, pathophysiology and um, we'll also talk a little bit more about it in terms of compression, but um, the, that muscle pump can really help with fluid return. Um, electrical stim can also reduce edema caused by poor peripheral circulation due to lack of motion, but you don't want to use it if the edema is caused by inflammation or by organ failure because you could make the inflammation worse and um, organ failure, um, there are going to be problems with fluids anyway. So um, it can be used in certain situations, but um, there are definitely precautions for that. So we want to, when you have a denervated muscle, um, that muscle has been damaged either by a um, like a forceful injury or by something like a spinal cord injury or a, um, or some other neurological condition. So when the, when the motor nerves are separated from the muscles, basically, it causes paralysis, muscle, muscle atrophy, and can, you can even build up fibrosis in the muscles. So in order to um, use electrical stim to... Um, contract a denervated muscle, you need that really long pulse duration, 10 milliseconds. Um, you need to directly um, electrical stim that muscle. You're not doing the nerve, so you have to be on the motor point with that. Um, it's often a continuous direct current application, and um, you don't usually get improvement in functional outcomes, but the idea is to um, slow atrophy and maybe keep the muscle conditioned for if the nerve does grow back. So edema due to inflammation, the area is generally hot, red, and swollen. Sometimes they'll use um, negative polarity, um, high voltage pulse current to um, retard formation of acute edema. The negative charge repels negatively charged serum proteins in the, extra, uh, the interstitial fluid. Um, and you can get some pretty large um, magnitudes of reduction. And it's, in some studies, it was a similar magnitude to ibuprofen or cold water immersion. So um, I know um, one lymphedema therapist who uses high voltage pulse current. So this is one of those ionic effects that we talked about in chapter 11. So if the edema is due to lack of muscle control, usually the area is cold, pale, and swollen sometimes kind of puffy. Um, health, healthy muscles contracting to um, promote fluid return from the periphery is the goal of the electrical stim. And so we want to treat it with motor level electrical stim and combined with elevation. And these can be used in conjunction with or followed by compression. So um, if the edema is due to lack of muscle contraction. We are going to place the electrodes. We're going to use pulse biphasic or Russian protocol. Uh, Russian is um, basically the alternating current muscle stim application. Um, you can try, we'll try different ones in lab. Um, some people find Russian to be bitier than the pulse biphasic, but um, you can draw your own conclusions. Um, we're going to use the, um, use the electrodes on muscles around the main veins draining the area. Um, the pulse duration is going to be um, the same as we use for muscle stim. Um, and these parameters and settings are all in the book. Um, 150 to 350 microseconds for pulse duration. A frequency of 35 to 50 pulses per second. Um, the on-off time is going to be one to two seconds on and one to two seconds off. So we're getting a pumping um, motion with this, so pretty equal on-off times. The amplitude, we want to produce a small but visible muscle contraction, and we're going to treat for 20 to 30 minutes per session, usually with elevation. So here's our um, application. We're pumping the gastroc muscles um, with elevation, and that's 
the edema that's resulting from lack of muscle contraction. So for um, this is for strengthening, um, doing a muscle strengthening, we want one electrode over the motor point and the other over the stimulated muscle aligned parallel to the muscle fiber direction. So obviously this one's treating the quadriceps. Um, we want the electrodes to be at least two inches apart. Um, the joint is going to be in mid-range and we either want an isometric or an isotonic contraction. So um, if we're having them perform a physiological voluntary movement with it, it's an isotonic contraction. Um, if we're going just for the muscle contraction, we could have them do an isometric as well. So um, the amplitude and pulse duration, um, so what we want greater to or equal than 10 to 50 percent of the maximum voluntary isometric contraction of, an, of the uninjured limb. So um, we want a pretty good amplitude to get a good contraction. The pulse duration is going to be between 150 to 300 microseconds. So we're going to start at the low end and then if um, the amplitude that the patient can tolerate doesn't produce the contraction we want, we can turn up the pulse duration. Usually larger muscles will re require larger pulse durations. Um, the frequency is going to be 20 to 30 pulses per second for small muscles and 35 to 50 pulses per second for larger muscles. If you go above 50 to 80 pulses per second, it, it may not only increase muscle strengthening, but it also increases fatigue. However, with frequency, if you are not getting, if you're getting muscle twitching, twitching but not tetany, turning up the frequency is going to increase the number of action potentials and get you closer to muscle tetany. So if you're on the low end of the pulses per second, turning up the frequency might get you the muscle contraction that you want. So um, usually our on off time, our on time is going to be six to ten seconds for strengthening, and off time fifty to one hundred and twenty seconds. So on off ratio of one to five or uh, one to one to three. Um, the more um, the weaker the muscle is, the longer the rest time you want to have, and you want the ramp up ramp down ramp down time to be one to four seconds. If you have um, spastic antagonist muscles, you need a longer ramp time.